This video was sponsored by Rocket Money. This week, Starbase explodes with activity. We've seen loads of work on the orbital launch pad, plus new ships getting built in the high bay, and an old ship making an unexpected move. What's up, Tank Watchers? I'm Jack, here with NSF with this week's Starbase update for you. This week, we'll be tackling two big questions. One, what is SpaceX doing to get ready for the next Starship flight? And two, when will pre-launch testing resume? Let's get into it. Of course, not everything in Starbase is about the next launch. Sometimes it's about the launch after the next launch, or the launch after the one after the... You get the idea. SpaceX is lining up multiple vehicles for flights far into the future, and this week we saw lots of progress on Ship 29. Stacking of Ship 29 began about three weeks ago in the high bay, and now it's nearly complete, missing only its aft section. An interesting thing about Ship 29 is that for stacking of this vehicle, SpaceX has used the new lifting rig that lifts the ship from its chopstick lifting points, rather than the crane lifting points that are at the tip of the nose cone. However, if you look closely, it actually looks to be using some of the crane lifting points as well. It appears this new test rig needs to be hooked up to a couple of lifting points that are located on the leeward side of the ship. Friendly reminder that leeward is the side without tiles. We saw the teams use this rig about a month ago on Ship 28, and and then it was dismantled. Perhaps SpaceX discovered that for lifting ships, the new rig needed a few extra lifting points for stabilization purposes. The machine that builds the machine is constantly being worked on, as always. Right next to Ship 29 in the high bay is Ship 28. Ship 28 has been having a bit of quiet time inside the high bay, with workers setting up scaffolding around it and seemingly preparing it for when it undergoes its own round of testing. You can see it's still missing its aft flaps, so despite being fully stacked, SpaceX doesn't appear to be worrying too much about that part of the hardware installation process. Clearly, they're paying more attention to other kinds of work. Of course, we can't really tell what most of this work entails without somehow sneaking a camera inside the high bay. If only SpaceX would tell us what kind of stuff they do to these vehicles at this stage. Right next door to the high bay, at the mega bay, Booster 9 and Booster 10 are still awaiting their time to shine. Because, you know, they're stainless steel, so they shine, of course. I'm sorry. SpaceX appears to be preparing Booster 9 and Booster 10 for their own respective upcoming test campaigns. Booster 9 engine and shielding installation should be wrapping up if it hasn't been finished already. We could see Booster 9 heading to the launch site as soon as the orbital launch pad is once again ready to withstand the force of Raptor engines firing against it. Also in the Mega Bay is Booster 11, which is a little more shy than its shiny siblings, so it's a little bit harder to see, but as of right now, its methane tank has been fully stacked. Based on this, we can expect Booster 11 to be fully stacked in just a few weeks. Remember how a moment ago I said the machine that builds the machines is constantly being tweaked? Well, one of those tweaks has taken the form of a building extension to the Mega Bay, sort of an annex on the lower two floors. We've talked about this extension multiple times on weeks we're fortunate enough to get a peek inside of it. This week, we were able to see multiple racks filled with hardware inside that extension building. Now just imagine how much space SpaceX can save inside the Mega Bay by not having all of this hardware strewn about, but instead having it inside this building annex. This week, we also saw the preparation of a new crane at the production site that will be used in the construction of the new Mega Bay. Again, it's very important to stress that all the work at Starbase is not just for the very next flight, but for multiple flights down the line. With more and more vehicles being built, it's of utmost importance for SpaceX to have another place to store and process them. Given that, it's no surprise that we've seen three sections of the new Mega Bay getting prefabricated next to the propellant production site. Once complete, these sections will be transported to the new Mega Bay location for installation using precisely that new crane I just mentioned. When do you think the new Mega Bay will be complete or at least ready to accept vehicles? By the end of summer? By the end of the year? Let us know what you think in the comments. I'm gonna guess sometime around the end of the year. But remember, even the current Mega Bay isn't yet complete, but that doesn't mean they're not already using it for vehicles. As for the rest of the production site, we don't have much to report this week, so let's move on now and take a look at the Massey's test site where a new and exciting development has occurred. But before we do that, a quick note that we're constantly trying to up our video game here at NSF so we can bring you ever better content. And one way we're able to do that is by working with sponsors. This week's sponsor is Rocket Money. Are you looking for a giant plot of land to build Mars rockets? Probably not. But if you're looking for something a bit smaller, like a new home, Rocket Money can help. Rocket Money is an all-in-one finance platform that can help you spend less and save more. That includes helping to cancel unwanted subscriptions. Rocket Money safely and securely identifies recurring payments and helps you cancel them with just a tap. With the myriad of subscription services that are popping up these days, this is so helpful. 
I was able to cancel some subscriptions that I didn't even know I was still paying. Rocket Money gives you a clear picture of your net worth, including your cash, debts, investments, crypto, and more. Plus, it shows you how it's trending over time. You can also set budgets, and Rocket Money will notify you when you've exceeded them. It can even help you visualize your spend to earn ratio. And it's trusted by more than 3.4 million members and counting. In addition to the web, it's also available on iOS and Android. To try it out for free and unlock more features with premium, check out rocketmoney.com NSF or scan the QR code on screen. The link is also in the description. Thank you to Rocket Money for sponsoring this video. All right, now let's move over to Massey's. By now, you probably know that one of the biggest hurdles for SpaceX to jump over for the next Starship flight to happen is the recertification of its flight termination system. SpaceX seems to have tested the B-6 test tank at Massey's this week, and here we see the aftermath of what appears to have been a pretty violent test. This result is precisely the one that we would have hoped for. After all, the main issue with the FTS system on Starship during its first flight was that it didn't efficiently terminate the flight. And as you can imagine, it's kind of important that the flight termination system rapidly terminates the flight. So we can now say that SpaceX is definitely doing material testing and making visible progress on this issue. It would be interesting to see if they do more actual testing on test vehicles themselves, or if they just move on to simulations from here using this piece of real world data. I certainly wouldn't be disappointed if one of the disused ships or boosters at the production site ended up getting used for a sacrificial test for the greater good. I'm never one to complain about a controlled boom. Also at the Massey's test site resides the NC-31 test nose cone. This fella got quite a beating a few weeks ago during testing, and it seems like crews are still working on it afterwards. Maybe it'll get repaired and tested again. Maybe, maybe not. It's really hard to know at this point, but we'll definitely keep an eye on it just in case. Perhaps the biggest and most surprising news this week is that Ship 25 left Massey's. What was surprising was that it didn't go to the rocket garden to be scrapped, it didn't go to the production site to get worked on, it went all the way to the launch site. To be fair, we had seen some indications of this on previous days, with a giant SpaceX LR-11000 crane moving next to the suborbital pad B, and cones being placed down at the launch site. We also saw rollout closures posted on the county's website, and we even saw an aborted attempt of the rollout as well. It seems like SpaceX had some work to do on the SPMTs, or the road, or both, before finally trying the move once more. Now, let's move over to the launch site, because there's been a ton of work done there over the last week. Something interesting we've seen over the past week or so is that SpaceX teams have been digging near where the methane tanks are located at the orbital tank farm, sort of where the old Starship landing pad was located. It's sort of curious that this work is ongoing at this location, given it's where methane trucks typically offload methane into the orbital tank farm. Are they laying the groundwork for more tanks to be installed here? Stay tuned and hopefully we'll figure it out soon. Another week at Starbase means lots of work underneath the orbital launch mount to prepare the foundation for the installation of the new Delu system and water-cooled steel plates. This involves drilling deep into the ground, lowering super long rebar cages into the drilled hole, and then filling the hole up with concrete. You can even see workers building these rebar cages and then lowering them down to form the foundation. A really good way to get a sense of scale here is from our long range cameras that are a few miles away. And you can see that these rebar cages are long, like really long, probably around 100 feet long. As the days pass, all of this foundation work evolves over different locations in and around the ground immediately under the orbital launch mount. It's pretty cool to watch the different lifts and cranes slowly putting everything down and preparing the site. In fact, I bet if you go tune into Starbase Live right now, there's some of this activity underway. So why is all of this foundation work so important? Well, if you're going to put several tons of steel underneath the orbital launch mount and let it face the fury of 33 Raptor engines firing against it, you kind of want to have a solid foundation for it to be anchored to. Otherwise, on Starship's second flight, instead of flying concrete and sand, we might end up seeing flying steel. To prove this new system works before it is installed at Starbase, SpaceX has been testing it at McGregor. In fact, SpaceX showed off one of these tests this week on Twitter. You can see here how the piece of steel is shooting water out in all directions. And as the engine starts up, it starts blasting the steel. But not even that is full power. After a couple of seconds, it seems to throttle up, simulating the liftoff throttle up that Starship does on takeoff. However, unlike on launch day, the Raptor keeps blasting it for several seconds instead of what would happen in real life, which is that the rocket would lift up and fly further and further away. So SpaceX seems to be going above and beyond to test this new system, blasting it for far longer than needed. Yesterday, we released a marvelously in-depth video narrated by DOS, going through all of the things that went wrong on Starship's first flight, from the blown up concrete to the Raptors failing to the flight termination system not working. He goes over everything in thorough detail, and it's a really good watch. 
definitely check it out if you haven't already. This week also saw the removal of cryogenic pipes leading to the orbital launch mount. These cryogenic pipes need to be removed in order to facilitate the installation of the pipes that will channel the water from the deluge tanks into the steel plate that's going to be installed underneath the launch mount. Over at the back side of the launch mount, we saw SpaceX teams move a series of long, thin, black tanks that were delivered a few months ago. These tanks are being stacked right next to the big white deluge tanks. The new black tanks are likely going to be used for pressurization of the water as it's pushed out to the plates underneath the orbital launch mount. After all, in order to push all of that water, SpaceX will need lots and lots of pressure to send it out in what Elon called an upside down showerhead. Next up, over at the suborbital side of the launch site, We've seen a large amount of concrete work done on the berm between it and the suborbital tank farm over the last few months. This has presumably been done to harden the berm and protect it and the suborbital tank farm from Raptor static fires on ships. Well, this week, that work appears to be finally wrapping up, just in time for Ship 25's static fire campaign. That's right, I said Ship 25's static fire campaign. And we know it is going to be a static fire campaign because SpaceX themselves confirmed it. Right after rolling to the launch site, SpaceX tweeted Ship 25 has rolled out in order to perform a six engine static fire test. This begs the question though, is Ship 25 actually going to fly or is this just some testing that's being done in the interim before they test the actual next ship to fly? A lot of questions here, and hopefully we'll know the answer soon. But either way, I'm excited to see Raptor engines make fire at the launch site once again. As you can see, SpaceX is wasting no time fixing and upgrading their systems ahead of the next Starship flight. They're firing Raptors at water-cooled steel plates, working on FTS fixes, doing foundation work at the orbital launch mount, and, of course, moving Ship 25 to the launch site for static fire testing. Thanks again to Rocket Money for sponsoring this video. Don't forget to go to rocketmoney.com NSF or scan the QR code on screen to unlock more features with Premium for free. With Starbase abuzz with activity, I'd be remiss if I didn't do the YouTube thing and ask you to click the subscribe button or the notification bell if you haven't already. That way you can stay on top of all of the latest developments leading up to the next Starship test flight. And be sure to check out DOS's mega video on everything that went wrong with the first Starship test flight. That's going to be right here. Or check out our next This Week in Space Flight, which is here. All right. Thanks for watching, that's it for this week, and as always, be excellent to each other.